Luli Faber interviews Jesus on the subject of how the human soul functions. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 1st of April, 2013. This is session one, part one. Well, welcome today to a discussion that I have invited Luli Faber along to join me with. And that discussion is about how the human soul operates. The main reason why I wanted to have this discussion with somebody was because we get many questions about the soul and how the human soul operates. But um, much of, many of these questions are based around assumptions that are false about the soul itself. And there is a, often a confusion between the mind and the soul. And there's also a confusion about what constitutes the soul as compa compared to the mind. And so during this discussion, we're going to talk primarily about how the soul itself operates in comparison to how the mind operates. And that's why we're, we're having the discussion. The, once we have this discussion, we have then the ability to refer to this discussion when we're answering questions about the human soul. And in the FAQ channel, there will eventually be many, many questions that we want to answer about the human soul. But most of the questions will be answered by referring to some of these principles that we're discussing in this, in this discussion that I'm having with Luli. So thank you, Luli, for coming along and joining me with the discussion. Pleasure. And, uh, and the may, uh, I just feel like I've said to you off camera that be, feel free to answer, ask any questions as we go along and also point any points of clarification that you want to make. And uh, I've really just asked Lily to come along to keep me in line today. So, <laughs> so if you keep it's me in line today, concept. that would be great as well. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, just talk about the human soul in comparison to the spirit body's uh, organs and the physical body's organs initially, I feel. And when God created the human soul, he knew at some point that uh, due to its creation that he would separate the two halves of the soul and have an incarnation process where they could become individualized. And as a result of that, he, he created all of these sensory apparatus in each half of the soul that when the two halves of the soul split apart, the sensory apparatus in, in one half of the soul has to connect to something. And the sensory apparatus in the other half of the soul has to connect to something in order to experience the universe around it. And God created this wonderful process where a human couple who love each other, make love with each other, create a, uh, two bodies, the, two, the spirit body and the material body. And the, the, the soul, the half of the soul, the sensory apparatus can now connect to those bodies through these cords and therefore experience the universe, firstly experiencing the physical universe and then experiencing the spiritual universe. And so, so the physical body has organs of its own. So we have the organs of sight, hearing, all the sensory apparatus, plus a brain and all the internal organs. And they all are used by the physical body in order to maintain itself while it's alive. And the spirit body also has a whole group of similar organs. Uh, it has a heart, it has a, it has a mind, it has the sense of sight and other senses. And in fact, it has an even greater amount of senses than the physical body has. And so we have these two bodies, which are basically like organisms, or you could almost think of them as robots, that the half of the soul, the one half that split away from the soul in the union state in its unincarnated state, the half of the soul can now experience the universe through until it reaches the union state again in a conscious manner. Now, for all of that to occur, there, we must start to understand what we're developing if we're actually growing in love, what part of ourselves we're developing. So we're obviously not developing the physical body as, a, as the primary point of development, and we're also not developing the spirit body as the primary point of development. We're developing the soul. And so therefore, we need to understand how the soul works. We need to understand you know, how it's organised. And we also need to understand that our physical body and our physical body brain is actually being exercised by something be behind it through this silver cord that connects our, spirit, our physical body with our spirit body. And then our spirit body's brain and all of its other organ organs are also being influenced by something behind it. 
the, the, the soul of the individual. The, and it's the half of the soul of the individual because it's yet to be into a completed union state. Now, if we, if we remember that in this discussion, then that will help us greatly in terms of determining what the soul is and what the, the spirit body's mind is and what the physical body's brain is in particular. Because a lot of the questions we receive are all about, uh, a lot about, you know, if I exercise my mind in this direction, does that, how does that relate to my soul? And is my soul developed if, my, if I've developed my mind? And there's all these... Uh, how, there's all this idea or concept that people have that you can make your mind be more loving when that's actually a physical impossibility. And there's all these basic concepts of misunderstanding that I feel cause people's questions that we, we really would like to iron out. And the way we can iron them out is by discussing how the soul works, how the spirit body works, how the physical body works to a degree, and how they all fit together to, to become our conscious existence firstly in the physical world and then in the spirit world. So if we refer firstly to this physical body, of which you've have a, had a lot of uh, work on the brain and so forth, you, yep. you can see in science that generally there's a lot of emphasis on the brain and its ability to control all of the functions of the physical body. And what have you found in that process? What have you found? Well, there's, <clears throat> there's just a complete mystery as to how it manifests the mind. Yes. You know, everyone thinks that somehow a bunch of nerve cells going off can create thoughts and ideas and beliefs. And personality. And, per yeah. and personality and free will and all these things. But yeah. no one has the foggiest, like there's not even a theory. No. It's just, you know, no idea. No idea about yeah. how it works. And, and so what we need to do is look, talk about perhaps a bit about how it actually does work so that people can understand. So firstly, we've got our physical body and let's focus on our mind because that's where a lot of our thought obviously seems to take place, if we could say. But the reality is, as you know, through working with the brain, that a part of the brain can die and then you would think if that part of the brain had died, then the thoughts associated with that part of the brain would also be dead. But there's been occasions when a person's gone through some kind of recovery process uh, after a stroke, for example, and then all of a sudden they get back the memories that you thought they lost. Uh, and that's pretty obvious then that that part of the brain didn't contain the memories that they lost. It was a temporary loss for some reason. They explain it as it's some kind of diffuse network of information and they just source it from another bit of the network. Exactly, know? exactly. And then there's also the issues that you would have heard about too, and it's pretty obvious that people have lost their sense of sight and then all of a sudden, through some uh, medical operation or whatever, regain their sense of sight. So, so this kind of, uh, these kind of instances show that, that the, if the physical body loses a sense of some kind, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person behind the physical body has lost that sense at all. What it means is that the physical body is unable to manifest it, is unable to actually have an outward manifestation of what the capability is anymore because of the loss of the sense of the physical body. So the physical body has senses of its own that obviously are connected to something behind it, and that's our spirit body. So our spirit body has a sense of sight, our spirit body has a brain, and it exercises through this silver cord connection that we've talked about before, the, all of the senses of the physical form. All right? So, um, and so that means that if a certain sense that's in the physical form dies for whatever reason, you know, we haven't cared for it or we have an accident or, or for some other reason, uh, then, then we haven't lost the memories of the, of, or, or lost the capacity to see in the case of a sight, if it's the sight, the capacity to hear if it's the case of a hearing sensation and, and other capacities. We haven't lost those capacities. We've just lost the ability to control them in the physical body. That's the only thing we've lost. And those, all of those capacities still exist in the spirit form. Now, if we look at the spirit body, it's almost identical to that. It's almost identical in operation to the physical body in reference to the spirit body. The spirit body in reference to the soul is almost identical in operation. So the pattern of the spirit body looking after the, and, and maintaining the physical body is the same pattern as the soul controlling the spirit body. So behind the spirit body is this 
organ, let's call it, let's call it a, the real us, the real person, the real individual, that has all these organs that control through a cord a series of energetic connections with the spirit body and control its brain and control its operation of all of its, of all of its internal functionings and also control its ability to, to emanate those particular things, to, to actually do something with those particular things. And, uh, and make choices and decisions and live in the spirit world. And the, and the half of the soul needs the spirit body in order to connect with the spirit world. Uh, if it didn't have the spirit body, it would have a limited sensory uh, ability to connect with the spirit world. Just like if we d don't have a physical body, we have a limited sensory ability to connect with the f physical world. It's not that obvious to a spirit anymore that they're living in that world. Whereas when we've connected to a physical body on earth, it's very obvious that we're connected to a physical body and physical things. And this is the reason why we need these bodies in order to grow. We ne and they're really like an educational system. The physical body being the educational system for our soul to learn the surroundings in our physical universe. The spirit body being the educational system that our soul uses to, to connect to the spirit universe. And then, of course, we, get, we can grow to even beyond that point where we no longer need anybody. And I don't mean we no longer need anybody. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> in terms you're of very other independent. People, we don't need anybody, <laughs> physical or material, in order to express ourselves. And in fact, we have the ability to create many bodies in that state. So if we examine all of that and we talk about the mind, which is the main thing that most people believe is the real person, the personality of the individual, and we talk about the soul, which is the real thing that is the personality and the individual person, and we start to compare where those things are and what happens to them, then you know, we'll have a far greater understanding of what we mean when we talk about soul development, and particularly developing our soul to grow in love. So if we focus on the, on the mind and the brain and, and, the, and the spirit and the, and the soul as well in terms of how they all are influenced by each other, this brain only controls the physiological functions of the body in which it is, in which it is encased. It doesn't control the thought processes or the personality or the emotions of the individual. They can be expressed through the brain, of course, because that's the reason and purpose for the brain, to express what is behind it, what is at the back of it. But all of those things are felt in, usually, for most people, their spirit form, their spirit body. So, so they have a mind in their spirit body, which is really the, like the brain of the physical body, and most of their memories and most of their thoughts are stored in this mind of the spirit body, and therefore, as soon as they pass into the spirit world, nothing's really changed. They can remember everything, and usually they can remember even more than they could remember using their brain of the physical body because their brain was an encumbrance in many cases by the time you pass. It's a bit decayed and old <laughs> and not able to be used very well. Um, but, but your spirit body's mind and brain is able to be used a lot more with a lot more functionality. And therefore, you can have a, a larger speed of uh, gathering information a larger speed of absorption of information by, the, by that brain and so forth and, and gathering more facts about the universe. But behind that is the soul which has the real mind. And the mind of the soul is just an organ of the soul. It's just a small portion of the soul. It's where, in the end, all potential logical functioning can occur. But for most people who, who live, that's not the case. Because what happens is they have suppressed their soul so much that the mind of the soul is, is not functioning and they use the mind of their spirit body in order to determine truth or in order to, do, to, to determine anything, in fact, about what they wish to do with their life, their personality, their nature and all, of other, all these other things are often a part of that, but not yet a part of their soul. And so what I, what I feel most people don't realise is that when they're using their mind, they're just using another brain, not the physical one, but their spirit body's brain, and they're using it in the, without any uh, reference to the soul, which is a very dangerous thing to do, actually, because it's also very logical to do. 
So that's the main relationship between the soul. The soul has eventually, when we're at one with God, the soul has its own mind. And in fact, the mind of the spirit body, the brain of the spirit body just becomes a tool that the mind of the soul exercises to express itself. Just like the physical body's brain is just a tool that the spirit body's mind uses to express itself. So there's this relationship between the three organs, if you like. Yeah. But it's possible in any, while you're in the physical form, to, um, to have the soul mind completely dominant. Yes. And the spirit mind completely um, just passive. Yes. Yes. And that, that was the transition I went through in the first century in the, before I became one with God. In the seventh dimension, you go through this transition. And in, in this transition, basically what happens is the mind of your spirit body, it sort of becomes like absorbed by the mind of the soul. In other words, the mind of the soul dominates it now completely. And so what we need to understand is the actual mind, which is really the mind of the soul, is actually just a small portion of the soul itself. It's not the soul itself. It's just a portion of the soul. It's a, you could call it an organ of the soul. So, so just like we have an arm or a leg or a kidney or a liver or, or a brain, which is our organ of our whole body, the whole soul has many organs. But the organs of the soul are not of the same nature, of course, as our spirit form uh, or our physical form. But, uh, but they are... There are what you would classify as different processes that occur within inside of the soul that by themselves cannot independently operate without the complete soul. Just like we have in our body physically independent organs in our body that cannot operate without the body itself. They need the body in order to function. And it's the same with the mind of the soul. The mind of the soul needs so many other things in the soul to be functioning in order for the mind of the soul to be functioning. And therefore, it needs development of the soul in order to function. Whereas the brain of the spirit body, uh, and the, uh, which is the mind if you, it, that most people use, and the brain of the material body, which is the physiological brain that we use to operate in this, in this physical world, those two things don't require much development in order to function. In fact, the physical body requires no development in terms of spiritual development in order to function. That's why God created it that way, so that we would be automatically functioning in a physical world. The spirit body, though, does require a certain amount of spirit development in order to function in the spirit world. So, so this is, and the reason why, is so that we develop in the spirit world and grow in the spirit world. So it does require a certain amount of spiritual knowledge and development uh, before a person will actually grow in their spirit form uh, in the spirit world. But the soul needs and can grow by itself individually and affect both bodies no matter where we are. It is independent of the physical world and independent of the spirit world. And so therefore has the greatest capacity for our interaction with all worlds. And, and I feel that's one of the things that most people are not aware of. They, they develop either their mind or they develop themselves physically. So a person, for example, developing their physically might, self physically might go to the, to the local gym, you know, and, and, and do some, and then they might read some books and get a heap of knowledge as well. And partially that is also developing them spiritually. Whereas when they just go to the gym and pump iron, most of the time that's just, or go running order, that's developing physically. As soon as they start picking up something that requires the engagement of their brain and therefore the engagement of their spirit body's mind, they're now starting to develop their spirit body as well, their spirit body's brain and also the body as a subsequent result gets developed through that process. And so, so they're now developing more than just their physical form. And then once you start developing this whole area of emotions and feelings and sensations and, and, and deeply emotional things, you're now developing the soul. And you can, the reality is you can develop all three things at the same time, obviously. But the soul has, its, has the greatest power. And the soul itself affects the functioning of both bodies. So if we have specific emotions in the soul, 
it will affect how the spirit body's mind actually even works and affect the physical body's brain and the physical body's the whole body of the physical body, all of its organs, and affect how all of those work. And this is one of the reasons why we get sick, is because there's an interruption to how the soul can affect those particular things because of something that's gone on in the soul, causing an interruption to the flow of energy and the flow of information from the soul to both bodies. So if most people understood that, then they'd start working on their soul when it came to sicknesses and diseases rather than working on just their physical body or their spirit body. Yeah. So I feel even that would answer a lot of questions for people as to, you know, diseases and sicknesses and, you know, if they've got some kind of terminal disease, for example. If they understand that behind their physical body is a spirit body and behind their spirit body is the soul and inside the soul when there's an interruption emotionally of some kind, it will cause an interruption in both spiritual and physical bodies which will create the disease. And, uh, and while that interruption remains in play, um, the disease will continue to grow. As soon as you reduce the in interruption from the soul, the disease will die a natural death and you become healthy again. And these kind of things need to be understood by a person who's trying to develop themselves, you know, to working out why they're sick and why they grow old and why, why they die even. It's all about what's going on in the soul. Yeah. So um, I suppose the main thing at this point is that we understand that the soul has organs of its own and one of which of those organs is the mind of the soul. The, the spirit body has organs of its own which maintain the spirit body and one of the organs is the brain of the spirit body. Um, the physical body has a brain right, that main helps maintain its body and it is just one of the organs of the physical body. And if people realise that the physical body is just like a robot that the soul uses to express itself in the physical world, and the spirit body is like the robot the soul uses to express itself in the physical world, then we would start to focus more on soul development rather than development of our mind. So the mind becomes sort of subservient to all other forms of development. Whereas for many people who are on earth, the mind is the dominant form of development that they engage in. They absorbed information through their mind and it's their main way of engaging with the world. And what I'm suggesting is that's not the main way the soul engages with the universe. Yeah. So um, just a question about the soul's mind. Is that, yeah. you know how when you list the attributes of the soul, like mm -hmm. the, um, the emotions and the personality and the free will, are they yeah. in the soul's mind? Uh, no, the, the soul's mind is a separate attribute of the soul okay. to those things. So, so example, that's where the logic of the soul is. That's where the logic of the soul is expressed. The soul's mind is the organ in which the logic of the soul is expressed. Um, there are other organs in the soul that express all other different things that are much more powerful than the soul's mind, actually. So, for example, if we look at uh, the organs, the, there is, the soul has a heart. And the heart of the soul expresses the, the love-based uh, feelings and, and emotions of the soul. And they are far more powerful and far more powerfully expressed than anything the soul's mind is capable of expressing. So, so there are organs in the soul that are far more powerful than the, than the mind, which is one organ that exists within the soul. But it is a necessary organ in the soul because it, it's, it's a necessary, accessory organ for in the terms of it, it, d determining logic. It's like, if you like, if you could liken it to a computer, it is like the microprocessor that is the centre of the computer that controls a lot of physiological functions of the soul in the same way. But it's not the dominant thing in the soul. And in fact, uh, if you've developed your soul, it becomes very subordinate. It is completely subordinate to other functionings of your soul. If I can give some other illustrations, so when we develop humility, for example, we view that as a quality, right? Like a, uh, uh, but actually, it's developed in an organ in the soul itself. Humility uh, is a is a part of the organ of the so organs that are contained within the soul, and it's actually a larger part than the mind of the soul, 
and it also dominates the mind of the soul and how it functions, right? So in other words, the organ of humility, which, which, we, do, which we express as a quality, actually controls how the mind of the soul works, right? This is why humility is such an important quality to develop in your soul. Because how, how it controls the mind is that the mind is unable to accept anything that the soul is, lacks humility about. You know, or if we put it another way, the soul's mind cannot accept anything in, about which we are arrogant, in which we believe we know the truth but have not yet fully discovered it. And you can see why, of course, because if, if while I'm lacking humility, I am blocked to certain thoughts, to certain concepts. I, I believe myself to know them already, or I believe they are immaterial, or I believe they're not important, or I believe they don't exist. One of the, those things usually is what I believe when I lack humility. And so humility controls the thought processes. I will not accept the thought that humility, or my lack of it, determines I should not accept. And so you can see from that regard, the mind is sub completely subordinate to this quality of humility. Does and this is both the physical, sorry, the spirit body's mind and the soul. Of course, because the spirit body's mind is just an expression of what's happening at the soul level anyway. So, so, so it will also greatly control what we'll allow ourselves to accept into our spirit body's mind. So, so we will not allow anything that disagrees with our concepts that exist within the soul with regard to the attitude of humility. So, so if I don't have humility on all subjects, it is only the subjects that I have humility on that I'll actually receive the truth about. And my mind is only capable of absorbing that truth while I am humble on that subject. As soon as I, as soon as I become, uh, have a lack of humility on that subject, that's like closing my mind to that particular subject now and my ability to, to learn more truth on that subject is now highly limited. Yeah. So, so in that regard, you can see that humility is a much greater quality to develop than intellectual development because it controls intellectual development completely. Um, if we have a look at another quality like love, Love is, uh, love is a quality that is understood by the organ of the heart of the soul. It is completely unable to be understood by the organ of the mind of the soul. So, so when we talk about expressing love, feeling love, uh, uh, acting in harmony with love and all these other different things with regard to love, our mind is completely unable to understand it, particularly, uh, and, and this is our soul's mind, is completely unable to understand it at all. It's Which is impossible. why we can't describe it in words. Exactly, it's impossible. it's impossible. It's impossible to describe effectively in words unless the person has had an emotional inflection of those words in their past. Right? In other words, they've had an experience of love in their past to which they can relate those words to. And, uh, and this is the limitation of our mind. Our mind is completely unable to understand feelings. Right? It can express them as thoughts, but it cannot understand them and feel them as feelings. And, uh, and this is one of our severe limitations of our mind, both spirit body and our physical body's brain, uh, but also the mind of the soul is limited in that regard. The mind of the soul is only able to express logical thought and is not able to, to actually feel feelings without the other organs of the soul being involved. So... So if a person hasn't developed their heart of their soul and they haven't developed the humility, the organ of humility in their soul, then you can see the, the spirit, the, 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 sorry, the mind of the soul is going to have a lot of difficulty determining any truth and also a lot of difficulty feeling any happiness and joy in any other emotion. And this is why people do get to the stage in their development on earth and, and sometimes in the spirit world where that's all, they almost feel devoid of emotion. They almost feel devoid of that kind of understanding because they can't understand it because they've only developed their mind and the organs that understand these other qualities are all undeveloped. They're, they're all lacking development. So humility is lacking development. The heart of the soul is lacking development 
And so therefore, love can't be understood, humility can't be understood. They can only understand intellectual logical reasoning, but the intellectual logical reasoning is flawed because it has not, it's not taking into account all these other developments that can happen. Yep. And it, the way God's made the universe is that without the entire soul being developed, the mind is incapable of understanding the universe. So, so that, that's a major limitation, obviously. If we're ever going to have to grow, we need to understand that part of our growth is going to be developing these other parts of our soul that are, that are independent of the mind itself. And in fact, that actually control the functioning of the mind itself. And so we need to understand that the development of the soul is the most important thing, not the development of the mind. And the mind has severe limitations in terms of its development. It's only capable of responding to stimuli without analysing very clearly the source of stimuli based on other, other emotional aspects of the soul or other organs within the soul. So, for example, the mind is often incapable of determining love by itself as a feeling because it's incapable of feeling love. The mind is incapable of accepting information about any subject unless humility is developed. So the mind itself can't, unless there is the soul that has, that's behind the mind having humility, the mind itself won't absorb any new truth on any, on any subject that the soul does not have humility about. And so you can see the mind is severely limited in its ability to reason, its ability to absorb truth, its ability to, to determine what the truths of the universe are and so forth. And, and while we focus on our mind, we, we continue to completely limit our abilities. Hmm. And it would be a really sad existence to just have your mind and no feelings whatsoever. It would just be like we wouldn't be human anymore, would we? That's right. And it's actually a physical impossibility to, ha to have just your mind and no feelings. So every single person who thinks they are focused on developing their mind and their intellect eventually does have joys and feelings as a result of their development. So, for example, when you, let's say you're in a passion, in one of your passions and one of your passions is finding out about the brain. So the more you find out about the brain, you have some joy come up, right, which is a feeling of the soul. That's not actually something that happened in your mind. The joy came from a different place within you. Not, it didn't come from the development of your mind. And you're engaging your mind and eventually understanding something. That process of feeling that you understand. You know how you go through, I'm confused, I'm confused. Oh, now I get it, that feeling. <laughs> and, and once you have that transition of I'm confused into I get it, the, you can feel your soul leap with an emotion, right? And that's immaterial to the mind. It's not the mind having that, that sensation now. It's another organ that's been developed within the soul. So, so from a practical perspective, even the people who feel that they are 100% focused on the development of their mind are actually developing their soul because they have these different experiences of joy and other emotions that occur through the development of their mind that start developing their soul anyway. So, so it's a, from what I've observed, it's a, it's a physical impossibility to not develop your soul in some way. Yeah. The key is to engage it in a, a, like a direct and... Uh, in a manner that doesn't, that, you know, we're, that we're not ignorant, that, that we have full disclosure of what's going on. From the majority of people, because we don't understand what's really going on, we don't know what we're developing. And in fact, the emotions almost seem to be something that you can't develop. You just have them. They're annoying. And, <laughs> they're and annoying someone else's of, fault. Well, they could be annoying side effects if they're painful. And if they're yeah. pleasurable, they're great. They're you know, they're, they're, yeah, yeah. I'll accept those. But, but either way, we sort of still see them as side effects. We don't really see them as the actual things that we can develop that are a part of our soul. We see them as sort of the side effect of following a certain course of action or exercising our will in a certain direction. But the reality is that these parts of, uh, are parts of our soul and our soul can be developed so much so that the soul's functioning controls the mind completely. That everything our mind chooses to do and, and, and every thought that we ever have is driven totally by the other parts or the other organs that exist within the soul. Yeah. So, so I feel as an introduction, the key thing for people to, re to remember is that God designed the soul 
to have a mind, but the mind is not the soul. The mind is an organ of the soul. The mind is a part of the soul, and the soul has many other parts, and many other parts of the soul are much more important than the mind because they control the mind. They control how the mind thinks. They control everything that it processes. And so these other organs, uh, and the organs of love and the organs of humility and other organs that exist within the soul, all part and parcel of certain parts of the soul itself, they need to be developed if we're truly going to grow as, a hum as humanity, not, our, not just our mind. Our mind will subsequently come along for the ride because it is under complete subordinate, it is completely subordinate to the soul itself. And, uh, and, what, and that's whether we think it's subordinate or not, it is still subordinate. So even if we believe that our mind is superior and our soul is not being uh, developed in any way, our, our, our mind is still subordinate to many of the functionings of the soul. It's just that we're not conscious of it in our mind because we don't wish to be. Like I said, anything that we're not humble about, we won't be able to process, even though it might be happening. We still won't be able to process it. Yeah. So I sort of feel like if, if most people understood those basic concepts, then we can introduce some basic concepts about how the soul works in comparison to the mind. If they, if they don't understand that the soul is the dominant part of yourselves, and remember here we're talking about the half of the soul, which, which is... Which is Really, in the end, we want to be connected with our other half of the soul, but initially we need to develop our half of the soul, the part that we're connected with too, with this body, before we can ever expect to connect with the other half of, of the soul. And the half of the soul uses the sensory apparatus of the physical and spirit bodies in order to experience both of those worlds. And if we, un if we understand that un basic understanding, then we will start to get some of the principles that we're going to mention when we discuss the different sort of understandings, if you like, of how the soul actually does operate and how I can change my soul and how I can have my soul grow and what resistance is in my soul and how can I determine what's loving and what isn't and how can I determine what is truth and what isn't. And once we understand how the soul works, then it, it will all make sense. All of those things will make sense to us. If we don't understand how the soul works, we will often try to develop ourselves in a certain direction only to find that it's a dead end. And then we have to retrace our steps generally and find the path that's not a dead end anymore. And the path that's not a dead end is always God's path because it's always the road to infinite understanding. Mm. So did you have any more questions about it in this introductory phase or do you think we're I just going to... I did have one. Yeah, fine. Um, it was about God's intention when God created it this way. Yeah. Um, so the way God intended it was that both the mind of the soul and the mind of the spirit body would just be um, like just tools. Yeah, you could say that... From the word go type thing. Yeah, I, I, I think if I can explain it this way, better it would be better. Remember, if we, can, if we look at the soul, we're talking about half of the soul here. What I'm saying is that the, the whole soul has a mind, right? And I'm only developing half of it when I develop the mind of my soul. I'm only developing half of it. But the spirit body has a complete brain that is not shared by somebody else. It's our brain. It, thoughts can be dropped into it, from external stimuli, but, but it's our brain completely. So the half of a soul connects to a whole brain in the spirit body and a whole brain in the physical body. But the half of the soul only has half of its brain functioning. Without the other half, a full soul brain cannot be realised. Does that make sense? A full yeah. soul's mind cannot be realised. And we need to understand the difference between these functions. So. So it's the half of the soul that exercises control over the spirit body's brain or the mind of the spirit body. It's a half of the soul that does that, not the complete soul. The complete soul does not need the spirit body's brain at all to function. It only, the half of the soul needs the spirit body's brain because it hasn't yet joined to the other half of the soul and therefore is, is not capable of experiencing 
all the stimuli that the complete soul can experience in terms of learning. And until such a time that it voluntarily undertakes the process of joining with the other half of itself, it will never have that functioning. So while we remain half a soul, while we remain independent of our soul mate or inde- uh, through and not go, don't go through a soul union, we need the, the mind, the half of the soul's mind, which is only half of the soul's mind or brain, needs the spirit body's mind in order to express itself. Okay. But okay. as you grow and grow into a soul union state, once you get into a soul union state, in the soul union state, the mind of the spirit of the soul doesn't need any spirit body minds in order to express itself because it now has a complete functioning organ of its own mind in order to express itself in a, in a logical manner. Does that make sense? Whereas when, when we are just a half of a soul, we must have a connection to a spirit body form and we need to use the spirit body's mind in order to express ourselves. But we're still, we've still got half of the soul's brain that we're using in order to express ourselves through that spirit body's mind. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's relatively logical when you think about it all. We've got half of our soul, which is what we see as our real self, but we're really only half of our real selves. And uh, so I'm sitting here, but the other half of me is somewhere else at the moment. And the other half of you is somewhere else. And, but we have also our half of the brain that we can develop in our soul. But that only usually starts developing once we trans, make the transition between the sixth and the seventh dimension of the spirit. So it's not a graded development? Up in- it is a graded development, but we, we usually first notice that something is different by the time we hit the seventh dimension. Um, up until that point, usually the mind remains dominant still. Our own phys- spirit body's mind remains dominant. But the development of the, of the soul's mind begins usually right down in, in the third and second dimensions of the spirit world when we start developing our spiritual natures and our emotional natures. And this is what causes or triggers the development of the soul and the development of the soul's mind. And so that begins way, way earlier, but, but we usually get to a point where we notice it, right? And, and if we have followed the divine way, the God's way in our development, we will notice it earlier than if we follow the natural love development. If we follow the natural love development, which is our own way, we, we can even get to the sixth dimension of the spirit world and not even know that our soul's mind has been developed in any way or that we even have a soul. So can you just give an example of what difference you might notice as you're using your soul's mind? The soul's mind, remember, is connected to these other organs and these other organs include love, humility, the expression of emotion, the expression of affection, the expression, all of these, all of these emotional aspects, which we could define as emotional aspects, are of the soul. So you will find that a person who's developing their soul becomes more emotional they also become more, you can feel more from them. You feel more of their personality. You feel more of their nature. It's not like they're sort of a, a rigid intellectual being anymore. They're now a very, they're a soft, changing personality that you can sense and feel quite strongly at times. And, and in fact, uh, you can feel the love that's in them and you can feel the other emotions that are in them quite readily as well. They haven't shut those particular things down. That's an indication that their soul has started to be developed. And the soul's mind is now starting to be affected by that development. Whereas a person who um, tries hard, uh, sort of almost like the Buddhist way, trying hard to suppress desire and suppress emotion and suppress feeling, what they're trying hard to do is to use their mind to control their soul. Now, of course, that's a physical impossibility in the end. You can't actually do it. No one, no one historically has ever successfully done it. And the reason why, that's the case, why that is the case is because God created it that the mind would be subordinate to the soul, not the other way around. And God created it that this mind is an organ of the soul and not the other way around. The soul is not an organ of the mind. And for that reason, um, we, we, it was impossible, in fact, to suppress 
our soul, using our mind, using our intellect. And so that's why you see the soul of the person come out at times. You know, even if a person is very intellectual in their development, you'll see their joy come out, you'll see other desires come out as they express themselves. And that's the soul being developed. That's the part of, the, part of them that is the real part of them. So, so um, this soul can be consciously developed, um, but for the majority of humanity at this point in time, the soul is unconsciously developing. You know, as a person develops their mind, learns new things, they experience certain joy and that causes their soul to feel some things and therefore become developed. So that's the way that most people develop at this point in time. But, but we could, instead of doing that, engage the soul's development, which is what I chose to do in the first century and what every person who's become a celestial spirit has chosen to do, and, and we can do this on earth. We can engage the development of the soul rather than the development of the mind. And as a result of engaging the development of the soul, the mind will subsequently develop more rapidly because the mind is controlled by organs of the soul that, that we, most people don't realise it's being controlled by at this point. So, for example, the soul's ability to feel controls how the mind thinks. The soul's ability to love controls how the mind thinks, controls its choices, controls its logical reasoning. The mind's ability, the soul's sorry, ability to be humble controls what the mind in terms of knowledge can absorb. So we can see that if we develop our soul, then our mind will have greater capacity to develop and greater capacity for understanding. If we don't develop our soul, our mind has no capacity for understanding at all if we're not careful. And this is why people who can have who don't develop any part of the soul, which is very hard to, to to do, of course, consciously, you can't really do it consciously. But people who spend very little time developing the soul also become very illogical in their understanding of the universe. They have all sorts of theories that they believe as facts that that are impossible to substantiate and are very illogical in their reasoning because their soul, the organs of the soul, all of the organs of the soul aren't being used to determine the truth. Uh, only the mind is, and the mind's trying to operate independently of all these other organs, which are all going to control how the mind absorbs truth. Yeah. So it's very important for people to understand that they will not be able to receive love through their mind. They will not be able to receive truth through their mind. The mind can be involved in the process but it's not going to be the thing that controls the absorption of love or truth. And if we're developing towards God, love and truth are the two things we're wanting or seeking. And so we're going to struggle if we use our mind to, to seek those two things. Yeah. Is there any other questions you had about it? No, no, no that's, that's it. So, so probably what we could say in summary into the introduction to this material is that we must understand that the soul has an organ called the mind, but it is just a subordinate part of the soul. The soul has many other organs and many other things that we can develop that are more important than our mind. And if we do not develop them, our mind will also be unable to develop fully. The spirit body's brain, which, we often re which spirits often refer to as the mind and people on earth often refer to as the mind, is just a part of that of that functioning of the soul's mind. And the more dominant we become with our, in terms of our material state, the more it'll turn out that we, we suppress the soul's ability to understand truth, suppress the soul's ability to, to understand the universe around us. And so God designed us purposefully with a soul so that we could come to understand everything in the universe. But what man is doing is they are suppressing the soul most of the time and for that reason they are struggling to understand the universe and they've, they're struggling with their mind to understand even our own bodies, let alone the universe. Uh, but as soon as we start to allow the soul to be part of the absorption of knowledge, then what's going to happen is it will stop struggling to understand the universe and all new, these new truths of which there will be many myriads of truths arrive to humanity through this process, 
all these new truths will be start to be absorbed by the soul. And so the soul has a greater capacity to understand the universe as a result. So I think that's a great thing about the way God's created it. God's created it in such a way that we have the complete capacity to understand everything that God's created eventually if we develop our soul and not just our mind.